Hello everyone, I'm Rob McBain. I'm the director of the Vascular Medicine Program at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Today we'll be discussing a really important topic of acute and chronic type B thoracic aortic dissection for Medscape cardiology. I'm joined today by my colleagues, Dr. Tom Bauer, the chair of vascular surgery at Mayo Clinic Rochester, Dr. Uh, uh, Alberto Pocatino, who is uh, from cardiovascular surgery here as well, and Dr. Randy DiMartino from the section of vascular surgery at Mayo Clinic Rochester. Today we're going to be talking about a really important topic. Tom, why, why should our audience care about thoracic aortic dissection? What's the big deal with this topic? Well, while it's rare, Rob, uh, with an instance of maybe three per 100,000 patients, uh, for us as surgeons or interventionalists, uh, it's exceedingly challenging, and it's one of the most vexing acute aortic syndromes that we deal with. And I think it's important, as you alluded to, first to define what's the difference in classification of aortic dissection. The DeBakey and Stanford classifications, which are pushing 40 years in age, are probably outdated. Uh, but it's very clear that individuals who have dissections involving the ascending aorta and arch become much more of an emergency than many of the type B dissections we have, and in fact, type B dissection occurs less frequently than type A dissection. Mortality risk is much higher in the emergency setting in type A dissections. There's been a real change in the management of, of uh, type B dissections, which means the intimal flap begins somewhere at or distal to the left subclavian artery, and I think a lot of that has been pushed by the advent of endovascular therapy. So one of the greatest advances in vascular and cardiovascular surgery in recent years has been the use of stent grafts to treat infrenal abdominal aortic aneurysms and thoracic aortic aneurysms where there's data to show that that's superior to open repair at many centers. And now it's being introduced and has been used um, uh, often to treat complicated type B dissection. So I think if we want to set the stage for this discussion, I think the first thing we need to do is define the difference between acute, subacute, and chronic. Acute is less than two weeks in duration, subacute between two weeks and three months, and chronic dissection is beyond three months. And then we have to decide are patients complicated or uncomplicated. Complicated by definition would mean rupture of the aorta or a malperfusion syndrome to one of the major organ beds, either by static or dynamic branch vessel occlusion. So patients that present with ischemia to the brain, the spinal cord, the extremity, the gut or the kidneys, all those patients would be considered complicated. The uncomplicated patient, although there are some people, including Chris Nienaber and others, that argue that every dissection is complicated, but the uncomplicated dissection would be someone who comes in with pain uh, the blood and elevated elevation of their blood pressure, the blood pressure becomes easily manageable, the pain goes away with medical management. A scan is done, there's no aneurysmal dilatation, there's no malperfusion syndrome, and so on. And right now, currently, that's really where, where the controversy exists. So if we walk through this, I, as I see the challenges now, the first, I think, is to begin to come up with a better scheme for classification of these, which will help the clinician manage them. And then it really goes into who should be treated, how should they be treated, and when they should be treated. Very good, thanks, Tom. Alberto, so we, now we have, uh, we have some classification schemes. We've got acute, we've got chronic, we've got complicated, we've got uncomplicated. Help us to discern which of these patients in the acute setting, let's start with acute, which of these patients should be intervened upon? So, I mean, some of that goes back to the history of how we got involved uh, in uh, managing dissection and uh, focusing on type B dissection, that's beyond the subclavian. The history goes back to the having to intervene when a patient is dying, I mean, very clearly. And, of course, a dying event is what we would now call complicated, you know, rupture or malperfusion that is significant enough that the patient has an organ in, in jeopardy that compromises their survival. And early on, the only option was surgery, open surgery. And open surgery typically, uh, we're talking about, you know, 60s and 70s, involved resecting some of the thoracic aorta to reestablish true lumen flow. Very early on, it became clear that that operation done on all comers with complicated uh, type B dissection was very morbid and had a high mortality as well. Of course, when you had nothing else to offer to somebody who's in trouble, that was the treatment. 
the advance of endovascular treatment has allowed us to provide something that succeeds in increasing true lumen flow, which is for most malperfusion the goal, or stop the leakage if it's ruptured without having to open the chest and replace the thoracic aorta. And the treatment of the endovascular therapy for complicated type B dissection over the last decade or so has become so good that the treatment using open technique has pretty much gone away. Uh, the, the morbidity, mortality profile of endovascular treatment of complicated dissection is far superior with endovascular treatment compared to anything else historic. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the first issue. Somebody who is dying either from rupture or from uh, organ malperfusion should be treated. End of story. Endovascular treatment is the preferred route. The next issue then is those that have a non-life-threatening problem but clearly have a problem. And uh, so the, the non-complicated, which traditionally were treated medically, and the issue to some degree is why treat somebody who's doing, gonna do fine short term? If you look at IRAD data, uncomplicated type B dissection have an acute mortality of less than 10% in the five to 10% range within the first few months is the mortality of an uncomplicated type B dissection. However, if you look at the same data and look five years out, almost half of those patients will die of typically complication their dissection. So that's where the driving force of doing something uh, without hurting the patient because you have to start from that 10% or less mortality up front and yet get this patient to survive much longer than five years or 10 years. Uh, and that's where the, the benefit of endovascular treatment in treating patients who are not dying, but you know they're not gonna do well long term if left alone. Very good, thank you. So, you, so the patient comes into the ER. They, the diagnosis is made. They're treated in the hospital. They're dismissed from the hospital, and now they're in the the post two week into the subacute, maybe into the chronic setting. So now the patient comes to the vascular clinic or the cardiac clinic. When would, if we're going to intervene, when would we want to intervene on this patient, Randy? What 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 what's the timing? How long should we wait? Should we uh, extend the time for quite some time, or should we offer them a, 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 a rather prompt uh, repair of their dissection? That's an excellent question. And the, the, as we've discussed in the acute setting, in, in those complications, you have to intervene right away. And then once we realize the patient is non-complicated or uncomplicated dissection, the question is then when is the optimal time? to intervene. Historically, we've waited for something bad to happen, such as an aneurysm to form, uh, or worse, aortic rupture, or um, other uh, aortic complications to occur. The question is, is can we prevent those from happening because upwards of uh, 30 to 50 percent of patients will have something happen to their aorta long term when left untreated. So there's a large number of people that we would like to be able to intervene sooner upon. The question is, is when's the right time to do that? And there's a balance. Uh, if you intervene very early in the uh, acute setting. Uh, intervention with uh, endografts has a higher rate of retrograde dissection. The intimal flap is very thin. Uh, it would be very easy to propagate that in a retrograde fashion, leading to a second aortic emergency. Um, by delaying the operation by some time, uh, you can decrease that risk. Uh, but if you delay too long, the dissection membrane starts to stiffen over time. Your ability to expand the true lumen will start to go away or it won't be as beneficial. Um, so the question is now, we don't really know the exact timing. We know probably sometime after the acute setting, but before several months time is the optimal time to do something if you wish to do it. And uh, encouraging data from randomized trials shows that that may actually alter long-term survival or long-term aortic related events. And it's an area of ongoing study right now to try to define when is that optimal time. Um, it's certainly not going to be right away, but by waiting too long, you may miss your window. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you. So the, the survival, survival uh, relating to uh, optimal medical management or an intervention, uh, TVAR, uh, uh, endograft, is nuanced. Can you talk to that a little bit, uh, uh, Alberto? We have the acute uh, survival. We have the long-term survival. 
you know, what's the, what's the difference? With, how, how, how does T-VAR help our, our, our survival uh, for these patients with the type B? So if we go back to the definition of complicated and uncomplicated, you know, the complicated scenario, uh, untreated patient don't do well. I mean, it, it, most of them die. Treated with traditional open surgery, the mortality can be in the 30 to 50 percent. Treated with endograft, the mortality has been uh, in most serious in the less than 10 percent range. Um, so, so clearly that's the way to go. Now, uncomplicated, um, the, the, you know, early mortality is low, and you want to keep it low when you intervene. And that, you know, the issue that was raised in terms of timing is we want to keep that mortality well below 10%. Um, we want to, however, improve the survival long term, and this patient long term develop aneurysm. And, uh, you know, aneurysm repair of the type that this patient developed, you know, anywhere between six months to five years out, those are very complex operations. And some patient uh, may be elderly and not really able to withstand that kind of surgery. And you want to get to prevent that altogether. Um, so we don't have a number, but we certainly know that untreated this patient at 10 years, most of them, over half of them will now be there to have the option of an open repair or something else. So, so that's where it's important to intervene earlier. Very good, thank you. You've talked about open repair, Tom. Uh, it, we've talked about the benefits of an endograft. Is there a role for open surgery in these patients? And, wh and where would you see open surgery, uh, open repair being played out here? Well, there's really two, I mean, open surgery in the acute setting, as Alberto has alluded to, um, is to be avoided if at all possible because the mortality and morbidity is just so exceedingly high. So I think there's very clear data now around the world suggesting that stent graft repair when, f when possible is the better alternative. Um, once you get beyond the two week to three month uh, mark and patients develop an enlarging aneurysm, for example, or some other complication, then there is a role for open surgery. So in our view here, uh, we would treat patients with connective tissue disorders, uh, younger patients that have extent two and three uh, thoracobdominal aneurysms associated with chronic dissection, uh, and then selectively higher risk patients because complex fenestrated endovascular repair in patients with chronic dissection is not a freebie either. So that's where I see the uh, biggest role for open surgery is the young patient, especially those with connective tissue disorders that have dissecting aneurysms or aneurysms that have degenerated as part of that. Very good, very good, thank you so much. Randy, you, the patient presents to you and he's dissected his entire aorta from subclavian all the way to his femoral arteries. How much do you fix? What, is that an important issue and, and, and you know the entire aorta's disease now, how much should you fix? It, it is an important question and thing to consider when you're treating. If you've made the decision to treat the patient um, the primary goal is to cover the primary entry tear, usually located just distal to the left subclavian. Um, beyond that, I think most people advocate covering a majority of the thoracic aorta um, down towards the celiac artery, although that hasn't always been done in the past. I think that's the feeling of most people doing the procedure uh, to treat. And the idea is to cover that section of thoracic aorta and try to help promote false lumen thrombosis. When that occurs, the aorta can then remodel around the stent graft. The risk is the more coverage you perform, the higher the risk of paraplegia. And so by covering a limited segment of the aorta just in the chest, you can try to minimize that, but these patients still have a risk of paraplegia um, even with that amount of coverage. So primary entry tear and the majority of the thoracic aorta I think is the mainstay right now. Doing anything more than that really elevates their risk, uh, their, the other associated risks with intervention, uh, most notably paraplegia. Very good, thanks. Alberto, final comment, future directions? Well, endovascular therapy has, has changed our life uh, and uh, most importantly has improved the survival for a lot of these patients. And the technology is, is progressing and I think we're going to be able to use this technology better with smarter, uh, better devices uh, to benefit more patients and the role of open surgery will decrease. I think it's important, however, that we have all options available. 
uh, so that when a patient comes in, we don't just have one tool, but we have multiple tools. Uh, and I think having open surgery as a backup is always important to have the ability to manage the patient in any which way that is necessary. It's going to be important for success. Thank you. Rob, may I make one final comment to what Alberto said? You know, I think one of the key issues for future clinical research is trying to identify factors, whether they're anatomic or physiologic, that will predict the patients that have an uncomplicated dissection and the timing of intervention with a stent graft to allow for this remodeling, as my colleagues alluded to. I think the second key thing is that in any institution that handles aortic emergencies of any sort, I think it's very important to have emergency room and care pathways and protocols in place and standardization of practice as best uh, we can do it. Very good. Thank you. Thank you thank all. You. And thank, uh, thank you for listening uh, to the viewers. Uh, we appreciate your uh, time. Uh, we hope that you'll continue to follow our roundtable review series at theheart.org on Medscape. Uh, thank you. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.